First John chapter two, verse 18, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy Spirit and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus, uh, Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will too abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, it is true and, and is no lie, just as he's taught you, abide in him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we ask that you bless our time in your work, edify us, build us up, strengthen us to do your will, build up your people, God, for your glory. In your son's name, amen. It was the year 1999, and the world was about to end, or so we were told. Uh, we were a mere year away from the all-life-destroying Y2K bug. Y2K stood for the year 2000. They called it a bug because computer programmers decided to conserve bits by storing years as two digits. For instance, 80 instead of 1980. So when 1999 turned to 2000, aging software uh, relying on such space-saving dates wouldn't be able to tell the new year from 1900. And that would result in the code that ran the world failing, possibly the theory went in disastrous ways. Power grids would be knocked out. Bank systems would fail. Food shortages and mass unemployment might lead to riots. Society would teeter on the edge of chaos, not returning to normal anytime soon. There were TV specials on it. One entitled The Y2K Family Survival Guide was hosted by Leonard Nimoy, who played Spock on the original Star Trek. I kid you not. Go look it up. It's on YouTube. It's very fun. I watched a few minutes of it. There was an entire genre or survival guides that came out. They had titles like Time Bomb 2000, The Millennium Meltdown. Their covers had quotes like, the illusion of societal stability is about to be shattered and nothing can stop it. The covers had cities on fire and told everyone that they needed to stock up because the end of the world, as R.E.M. told us, uh, as we know it, was about to happen. Uh, but here, here we are, right? So spoiler alert, they were wrong, okay? <laughs> now, some people in the Christian community became convinced that Y2K somehow tied to end times prophecy in one way or another. End times theology as a technical term, eschatology. There's a variety of views, eschatological camps, and they have very goofy technical sounding names. Listen to these two quotes regarding Y2K from two different opposing camps. So these guys believe the opposite about the end times. The first is from a premillennial dispensationalist, right? I know, sounds like something you might catch if you swim in the wrong creek, but uh, this is this theological words. His name was Ron Reese. In 1998, he said, in short, you do not have much time to prepare for the greatest. Oh, this is also, this is all capitalized what I'm about to read to you. So I'm going to have to say it louder. The greatest social, political, and financial crisis mankind has faced. <laughs> exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. The Bible prophecies several major military conflicts during, or prophesies several major military conflicts during the final seven years of the tribulation. More than half of the population of the world will die. <laughs> Could this computer Y2K crisis play a major role in bringing about these horrible wars? The second one is from a covenantal post-millennialist, Gary North. He said, uh, the Y2K crisis will wipe out every na national government in the West, not just modify them, destroy them. I think the U.S. will break up the way that the USR did. Call me a dreamer. Call me an optimist. <laughs> That's what I think. This will decentralize the social order. 
This is what I have wanted all my adult life. They called him Scary Gary. Uh, In my view, Y2K is our deliverance. Just don't be in a city when deliverance comes. These two men have opposite contradicting theologies, and yet they were basically making the same prediction, and they both were wrong. They were so wrong. Nothing happened. Actually, one thing did happen. My wife, Emily, got grounded because we stayed out too late on 1999. She was still a teenager, and uh, her dad was not happy. Maybe, maybe he was listening to Scary Gary, or I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, but they were making the same predictions. And so while nothing happened, a lot of people believed these men and their false predictions and mass hysteria caused real damage to the lives of more than a few Christians. This family in the church I attended when I first became a believer were very dear people. And I'm just going to call the father Bob. Um, So I'm sorry, Bob. I I use Bob as my generic name for every story. Do we have a Bob here? This is a Bob free church? Come on. Is, if your name's Bob, raise your hand. I am safe. All right? So all Bobs are bad people. Um, <laughs> call him Bob. All right, we'll call him Bob. He was a very respectable man, very kind to me, dressed well, presented well, had a beautiful wife, beautiful children. I believe he was an architect. Um, he was a great guy, threw me a uh, graduation party, gave me $500, which is a big deal to me back then, and just really had invested in me. So I, I loved and respected this man, and he, man, he got into Y2K. He was like, what are you doing for Y2K? I was like, hanging out with my girlfriend, right? Wouldn't be doing that in the city. I was like, well, it's the suburbs. I, you know, I think, I think it would be cool. I was like, what are you doing? He's like, making preparations, do tell. Um, and so he had uh, bought a farm. He had bought a bomb shelter, put it under his barn somehow, and had uh, all this livestock, right? And I remember I said, he, it is pretty, he was crazy, but rational in ways. I said, what, what if nothing happens? She's like, well, you know, everyone needs a bomb shelter. I was like, oh, uh, you know. I don't think so, but, but livestock is, it has its place. So anyway, um, the, the day after 9-11, like I woke up like, oh, I know who I have to call, all right? Because nothing happened. I, I think some taxis got messed up in China. I remember reading that somewhere. Um, so I call him up and I said, hey, Bob, it's, uh, it's, it's Michael Foster. How you doing, man? Hey, you are maybe down in a bomb shelter right now, but if you are and there's an answer machine down there, I just want you to know everything's okay. You can emerge. So, <laughs> so Christians have a habit of connecting end times predictions to whatever is going on in the news whenever it's going on right? Just, just the other day, I saw a woman connecting the upcoming solar eclipse uh, and the cicadas. We have two broods coming out that are going to cross. It's mostly Illinois is going to get the uh, brunt of it, so I hear. Uh, and she's like, we got cicadas coming out, locusts, and, and an eclipse. For some, eclipses are happening all the time, all right? And so are locusts or cicadas. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing right, is going to happen other than it's going to be really loud if you live near the woods in Illinois for a while. And I, the, the eclipse will be cool. I'm going to drive up to Xenia and, and watch it. But people are always connecting that stuff. Now, uh, what does this have to do with our passage? A few things. Our passage talks about the last hour and the Antichrist. Consequently, people connected to eschatology to the end times. And I've seen lots of wild claims about the Antichrist, but I think the majority of them are wrong. Uh, people mistakenly think the pa- this passage relates to future, and therefore they constantly connect it to their future. Um, so us, uh, they constantly connect it to the news of the day. Do you think this guy's Antichrist? Do you think that guy's Antichrist? You hear that all the time. I remember I once... Uh, I used to go downtown and preach the gospel, and I, uh, this one guy seemed so normal, and we went to go get a Big Mac at the McDonald's down there off uh, Fountain Square, and he said, 
I know who the Antichrist is. And I was like, do tell. <laughs> I'm always up for a good story. And I was like, who, who is it? It's Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, the, the performer. Well, the Antichrist looked like one person. And now he like, his face falls off and it's a different person. It's Michael Jackson, right? And I just said, now America's an amazing place. You can be born a black man and die a white woman. Um, but, uh, but so people have crazy ideas about stuff like this. Um, and no doubt this passage in the entire book of John is written for the benefit of all Christians throughout all time, including us. But its original audience was the first century church. It was written to encourage and equip them. So whatever it means, it must mean something that they could understand and benefit from. Now, I'm going to lay my cards on the table. I believe the vast majority of end time events and prophecies, or excuse me, the vast majority of end time prophecies are connected to two events, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD and the literal second coming of Jesus. I don't think they have much to do with almost anything else. That's the majority of them. Both of the events resulted in or will result in a new age. The temple being desecrated and destroyed in 70 AD was a big deal. The main persecutors in the church, except for the Nero persecutions, the ones that were giving Christians the hardest time in that first century up until the destruction of, of Jerusalem were the Jews. That immediately changed when the nation was brought to an end. The church exploded in growth amongst the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles. And in a sense, there was a new age of the Gentile church exploding and growing. The second coming of Jesus is tied to the resurrection of all the dead, resurrection to life for those who are born again, a resurrection of death for those who are reprobate, for those who aren't born again, and a complete renewal of all creation. So it's the end of history as we've known it, but the start of something new. So we can't get into all this today. So I want to recommend uh, a couple books. I'll just give you two books on the topic. Uh, the first one is Four Views on the Book of Revelation. It's a, a counterpoint series. So if you just go to Amazon, Four Views on uh, the Book of Revelation, you can see the four major views. Make your own mind up. I think Ken Gentry is right in that Four Views book. It's a very good book. Um, and I think he's the most correct. It's also very similar to a view advocated by R.C. Sproul in the last days according to Jesus. Again, this is my view, but it's not the official doctrinal stance of East River. We actually make a lot of space on this issue. There is room for respectful disagreement. So you have to believe in a second coming, a literal second coming, a resurrection of life uh, of, the, uh, of the living and the dead to a judgment. Um, you have to believe in uh, that there is some type of millennium but you can disagree a little bit on what that um, refers to. Now, I mention all this because I don't think the Antichrist is the same person as the beast of Revelation. I just don't think he is. I don't think he's the same person as the man of lawlessness mentioned by Paul in Thessalonians. Now, to some people, that is a controversial take, uh, but it shouldn't be because my view is not like a new view, and it's, it, there's a pale of orthodox. Uh, orthodoxy. There's a whole spectrum of things. I do think the man of lawlessness and the beast of Revelation is referring to the same guy, uh, but that's, I, I know, I know you want me to talk about it, but that's a different sermon for a different time. Uh, we've allowed Christian fiction like the Left Behind series to overpower basic rules of interpretation. The word antichrist uh, only occurs four times in the Bible all in 1 John and once in 2 John. So we, we, when we look at this stuff, we, we have this idea that Antichrist is like a big teaching in Scripture. But it, it really isn't, and it's, it's uh, all kept to uh, 1 and 2 John. Uh, so what, whatever it means must be determined by these passages. So who is the Antichrist? It's more of a what. Here's the three points I want to briefly make today. First, the Antichrist was a first century phenomenon, right? It's not a future thing. Well, it relates to the future, but it was something happening then. Second, the Antichrist was not a single person, but a movement by many people. Third, the Antichrist was a doctrinal tendency within the church, not a political ruler. So it's not Nikolai Carpathia. If you've been reading the Left Behind series, there you go, Steve West. 
He asked me to do that. The Antichrist was a first century phenomenon. How can this be? How can this be? After all those books, all those Kirk Cameron movies, all right? Well, listen carefully. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. Skip ahead to chapter 4, verses 2 to 3, same book, 1 John. By this you know the Spirit of God, and every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and now is in the world already. It is, it is already. This is something happening in the first century. I am telling you that using the news as an interpretive grid for the Bible will get you into all sorts of trouble, right? You work from scripture to history, not from history to scripture. Just read it in context. John says it is the last hour and the Antichrist spirit is already in the world. So how can the last hour be 2,000 years ago, right? That's a long hour. Turn to Acts 2, verses 14 through 21. This is the Pentecost sermon. I want you to see something. Now, Peter quotes Joel to uh, Joel chapter 2. If you were a Christian in the charismatic church like I was, you heard this thing quoted nonstop, right? And I'm glad. It's, it's part of Scripture, and it's important. We should know the minor prophets. But listen to how it's applied here. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose. Remember, they're speaking in tongues, and they're like, what in the world's going on? They're not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, I'll pour out my flesh on my spirit, or pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, right? On and on and on. Now, look at that. Look, look at verse 16. It's key. Peter quotes Joel 2, which says, in the last days it shall, uh, shall come that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And then the verse right before it, Peter says, what you see happening is the fulfillment of Joel's last day prophecy. I mean, he says it right there. Look at it. So the day of Pentecost was part of the last days. What does that mean? Well, a careful study of the last days, or in this case, the last hour, will make it clear that this often, maybe overwhelmingly, uh, refers to the entire period between Jesus' ascension and his return. That's what it's talking about. It's the last days. Now, there's some threads you can pull out here, and there's some, some more technical, some layers to this. But in general, that's what it's talking about. And that's what you have to make sense of, because Joel happens in the last days, and he says, this is happening right now. This is a fulfillment. Now, verse 26 makes it clear why John is writing this. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. The Antichrist are still a problem, but they are a problem that started in the first century and continue today, right? Second, the Antichrist was not a single person, but a movement by many people. Jesus warned them about this in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 5. See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. In Mark 13, 21 through 23, he says the same, uh, very similar. He says, then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ, plural, and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard, I have told you all things beforehand. This is why John can say, you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. You've heard this. He says, stick to what you've heard beforehand, what you've been taught. This teaching was communicated to all believers that there was any Christ coming into the world. It's part of the teaching of the true Christ. He warned the disciples that this would happen. Now, the word anti can mean in place of or against. 
And there's some argument about how it's being used with Antichrist. Um, in place of, uh, would mean like in the sense of a false messiah, like a lying substitute. Against, in the sense of a contradicting adversary, right? So it could be one or the others. I agree with one commentator, Plummer, who concludes that both ideas are at work here. He says that they are counterfeiting and opposing. I, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's an and both, right? And it kind of depends. Some, like you will meet crazy people like David Koresh who will claim to actually be the Christ, the Messiah. You'll have other people that are antichrist in the sense that they just attack the true doctrine relating to Jesus, right? But both are of the same spirit. They don't honor God. They don't communicate the truth about the son. They're counterfeits or they're opposition against the truth. Paul warned about these, uh, this type of men in Acts chapter 20 says, uh, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own self will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So the same idea is at work in this passage. Paul says, look, after I leave, there's going to there's gonna be wolves. But where do the wolves come from? From in the church, right? So we, we have to have fear from, or we have to be, have eyes without, but also eyes within. Like think about Ananias and Sapphira. They, they had a lot of, uh, they posed a real threat to the church, as did Simon the Magi. These were people that were brought into the church and through uh, moral corrupted behavior, lying, slander, uh, or false teaching, uh, could corrupt the church. And, you know, what's it like, what's worse, one Indian inside the fort or three outside, right? One inside. Uh, is that, are we allowed to say, is that PC? Am I, you know, no. Anyway. Um, so uh, they went out from us, he says, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain uh, that they are not of us. I've told this story here before, so I'll just give like a short version, but I used to teach a Bible study uh, in Anderson Township when I was young, and I was coming out of some churches that were pretty wild, um, and I met this, this guy came to a Bible study, and I always, I've referred to him as Mike the prophet because the first time he came, he started giving all these wild prophecies. God speaks to me all the time in dreams. And, and I remember uh, he once uh, took me aside and said, Michael, you seem like a skeptic of me. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's fair to say. Um, and he said, but I want you to know, I, I have seen that you are going to be a great end times general in God's end times army. Now, if you've gone to churches like I've gone, you maybe have also found out that you are going to be an end times general. So I don't know who's just an end times like foot soldier, because it seems like everyone's generals. But I said, okay, cool, man. Well, I guess when that happens, that happens, right? I don't know what I was, oh, oh, really? I, 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 like I was going to be blown away and like, oh, Mike, lead me into my great destiny, you know, um, but instead I was like, look, you know, I don't know what the Lord's going to do in the future, but if that's how God uses me, praise the Lord. He was not content with that. Right. I said, I'm just going to keep teaching the Bible though. I'm not going to talk about all these weird prophecies. I'm just going to teach what the word says, because you know, you have new prophecies. I don't even know the old prophecies in scripture. Like with Bible code, you guys remember the Bible code came out around Y2K. Like there's secret messages in the Bible. Hey, I'm still trying to master the not secret messages in the Bible, all right? I'm right. still trying to figure that out. How about we figure that out first and we'll see if there's secret messages. But no, my books, my conferences, my tapes, right? Buy them so you can learn to seek. Everyone's always looking for secret knowledge. And false prophets and false messiahs, they like to tell you you're special, right, in this way where they can manipulate you. Here's special knowledge that you can only get from me. But John's like, mm, this is, we have a doctrine that's been communicated to us throughout all history. You should stick to that. The anointing, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. He says you have, uh, there's some textual variance on whether or not they know all truth. But the idea is that all truth has been given to them and they don't need these super special messiahs and prophets and these antichrists to lead them into truth. They have truth. We have scripture 
And we have the Holy Spirit working in us. That's the point he's trying to make. So, uh, so I'll tell you what happened with Mike, the prophet. Um, turned out he was living with his girlfriend in sin. And we rebuked him for that. And he said, well, we feel like that's, uh, he says, I feel like that's, you're being legalistic. And we're like, the word of God says you can't do this. Well, I disagree. That's not what God showed me. And he left. That is the spirit of Antichrist, right? He is above the word of God and he has special stuff to give to you. Anytime someone has special, you know, knowledge, man, like just do the, you know, the Homer Simpson gift. It's my favorite gift where he backs into the, uh, he backs into the hedge. When people start talking about stuff like that, I'm like, okie dokie, <laughs> I'm out, man. Um, so we rebuked him and I don't know what happened to him. I hope he eventually repented of sin and he's right with the Lord. But, um, you know, what we see in John, we see in reality, which is false teaching and immoral living are almost always connected, right? One will lead to the other in time. And so it doesn't, it, it's, it's not a, it's like a chicken and egg sort of thing. One feeds the other. So repent, repent of those things. Third, the Antichrist was a doctrinal tendency within the church and not a political ruler. This is made clear in all the passages uh, that, that deal with the Antichrist. There's not very many, but if you actually go and work through it, um, listen, verse 22, who is a liar? But he who denies Jesus Christ is the son. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the father and the son. So if you deny the father and the son, you are Antichrist, right? Uh, verse, uh, chapter four, verse two. By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, right? Again, anyone that denies uh, cardinal truth about Christ. Then you hop over the second John, chapter one, verse seven. For many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. See, the antichrist here is not super unique in that it's not like just one person, but it's a bunch of people that are teaching these doctrines. It's almost like a school of false prophets that uh, reoccur throughout all of history. It's like if you study any false belief system, they always end up attacking the deity or humanity of Christ. It's just that that's the spirit of Antichrist. One of the big points is that John makes at the opening of this letter is like, we're giving to you what we have received. And guess what? We touched it. We touched him. We saw it. We know he's Jesus, right? We know he's the Messiah come in the flesh. He is a true Christ. We testify to you of this. These guys that are presenting to you other versions of Jesus are liars. They are liars. Man, the church needs a backbone. It needs a backbone. We will not call anyone a liar anymore. Like, I've had guys uh, email me. I get the sense that you're, uh, that you're implying that I'm lying. No, no. No, I'm not implying you're lying. You're a liar. Stop teaching that. You're wrong. Don't say that. Truth matters. Lies destroy lives, right? Nowhere is the Antichrist connected to a political power. Just go, type in the word. Go look at the four times it comes up. It's not political. It's always related to doctrine and deception. That's what it's always connected to. Um, I guess I made a promise, but this will like really trip up a bunch of you. I'll just tell you. I, I think Nero is the man of lawlessness and the beast of revelation. So I gave you a book, right? Now you have to read a book. Can I challenge you? Can I challenge you to read six books a year? Seriously, read one book every other month because I know a lot of you aren't readers um, and that's okay. Everyone has different levels at that. Um, some of us like are like <laughs> obsessive readers, uh, but read six books a year, one every other month. In one of those books, if you're curious about this, uh, is four views on Revelation. Check it out, right? What I like about those books is you realize that other people hold views that you disagree with for good reasons, for good reasons. We're gonna take stands on doctrine here. I'm willing to tell you what I believe and why I think if you disagree, you're wrong. 
But it is not, we're not going to use the finer points of theology as a litmus test for fellowship. That's not how we do things. There's space to disagree on these things. But anyway, there you go. Um, I made a promise, I kept it. All will be revealed. Um, <clears throat> it's all about doctrine and deception. So who is an antichrist? Anyone who uh, rejects that Jesus is the God-man, that he is the Christ come in the flesh. Look at verse 27. But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true, there is no lie, just as I have taught you, abide in him. John Stott, he thinks, and I, I believe he's right, that the false teachers probably were using the anointing as a technical term uh, uh, for being initiated into their special knowledge, right? And I've, I've seen churches kind of use it this way, like, oh, there's a special anointing on him. Now, I don't want to demonize using that, that language. I think there's a place for that. Um, but um, I, I wouldn't use it. But they're, they're saying like, well, you know, you guys don't have the anointing, right? You're not like us. We're like super duper special people. And I remember when I was this one church, uh, you would go up front. They'd always say, anyone who wants... Anyone that wants more of God, come up front. Now, what does it mean if you don't come up front? I think that's very manipulative. So you're like, well, I don't want people to think I don't want more of God, right? So I'd walk up front. And they would always have people like walk up and prophesy over you and blow on your face or whatever. But I remember um, this one teacher came through town and they would give you a special word of prophecy for you, right? Like it's, it's kind of like... Um, you know, a personalized horoscope, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and people would, oh, the youth would get so excited. Like, here's what, here's my, my uh, fortune cookie from Jesus. Um, and what he's, that's what, he's mocking these guys. Look, you have, you're a Christian. You have the anointing. The anointing here is, uh, it's, it's really referring to the Holy Spirit at the moment of new birth, God's spirit comes and opens our eyes to see truth about who we are, about our sinfulness and the all sufficiency of Christ. And the Holy Spirit illuminates scripture to us. So we don't need new revelation, but we do need illumination, right? We do need help to understand what the Bible teaches and to make sense of it. And the Holy Spirit does that. That Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, he resides in you. When you're reading scripture, he brings, helps you understand things, right? Are you dumb? I kind of am, right? I always tell people like I'm like an idiot savant, like one part savant and at least two parts idiot, right? It's comforting to me that the Holy Spirit leads me in knowledge, leads me in truth. God didn't leave you uh, to your, your own devices, Sometimes I look at these, um, these books on hermeneutics. They're so complicated. They, they start to make people think that they can't understand the Bible without a seminary degree. Not true. That doesn't mean training doesn't help you. It does. But if you just read scripture and, and meditate on it, the Holy Spirit will grow you. And these people are like, no, 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 don't tell them that. They need us. And what they need is the word of God in the membership Class, someone asked what some things that I'd like to see happen more in this church. Man, my goal is to get as much of the word of God in you as I can. I want more of that, right? Like I, I, if we just unleash the word of God through the pulpit and our discipleship ministries, your life will be changed. You will be protected. That's what you need. You need scripture. The simple gospel message is what these believers had heard from the beginning Rather than moving on from it to some new truth, they needed to abide, to hold on to the old gospel truth that they had believed from the start. We don't need new fancy teachings. God's spirit working through his uh, word will bring us into all truth. Read your Bible and pray every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. Don't read your Bible and pray every day and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. I was a little kid, you know, those little kid songs you learn, they're pretty helpful. Sometimes it's that simple. 
So what's, what's the application? What's this all about? There's a lot of different ways we take it. But I'll tell you this much, compromising truth in order to pacify antichrists, right? Heretics, false teachers, or to retain them in our church will inevitably lead to corruption and spiritual downfall. So one of the best prophylactics to protect you from that is simply to preach the word of God every Sunday. They can't take it. The Holy, the Holy Spirit working through his word convicts people. I'm not coming to your church anymore, right? Now, some people leave our church because this isn't the right place for them. They found another church that emphasizes things or is closer to the home and they have friends there and that's okay. We need hundreds of churches in the Cincinnati area. We need new churches. We want to see revivals in the church. So some people just leave because they found somewhere else they fit better. And God bless them, and we're happy for that. We, we pray that those churches would grow in faithfulness and in numbers, right? We're not competitors. This isn't market share, right? That's not how this works. Some people leave because they hate God, because they can't take their sin being convicted, right? They don't like the sting of it, and they don't like hearing true doctrine. And when they find out that they can't peddle their weird teachings... And they take off for somewhere else. And I, like, anytime you start a church plant, the two number, like the number one people that show up are malcontents and uh, false teachers. Now, 2020 was a different time. A lot of people had gotten, like, uh, people had been faithful at a church for years, ended up leaving. But when you start a church plant, you got to be careful. Because people that are bitter at their last church are looking for a new one. But there's always these uh, guys that older men that come in, they want to mentor you. And this happened at my first church plant. Like, oh, I just feel a call to mentor young people. Okay, cool. That could be cool. That could be helpful. I, I felt like in over my head um, back then, still a little bit today. But it, why, why are you like showing up to a random church and starting the conversation on why you're like how I need to, you need to be my mentor. So that this one guy shows up I'm like, okay, well, well, cool. You're welcome to join us. And, and the more I got to know him, he just had every weird belief he could. And he saw an insecure leader where he could come in and get a pulpit and teach weird stuff. And that's why you can't become an elder at this church without, you know, being, um, uh, without being examined and asked hard questions and, and put through it to make sure that you don't believe uh, anything that strikes at the vitals of what we're committed to. We have to be willing to call these people out. Now, again, uh, we don't want to be, uh, we need to, our intensity needs to be connected to the centrality of the doctrine. So if you disagree with me on who the beast of Revelation is, even disagree with me on Antichrist, I'd love to see your exit Jesus here. I'd like to see how you do a better job than what I've got here. But, um, but it's okay. It's okay. If you disagree with me on, on the resurrection, you're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with the clear teaching of scripture, like catechized throughout all of history and put down our doctrinal statement. We have to cling to the cardinal truths. And you know that by knowing your Bible. And so read your Bible with confidence. The Holy Spirit's working in you and he will protect you against these antichrists because there were antichrists back then and there are antichrists now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true. Uh, help us to just embrace it in the whole of our life, God. Convict us, lead us away from sin. Uh, we thank you for the anointing that we've received, your Holy Spirit. Uh, we thank you for how you've grown us. Lord, teach us how to be fighters that fight for truth, but also people that know how to uh, make distinction between main things and uh, secondary things. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.